Here's a common scenario. Your 18-month-old is acting fussy, maybe with a little fever. After a few days, you bring him to his doctor, who peeks in his ear. Yep, the doctor says, that's an ear infection. One course of antibiotics later, and Junior is back to his happy self. Simple, right? But it turns out that this quick scenario hides a lot of important decisions. In this lecture, we're going to concentrate on one of the most common medical problems diagnosed by pediatricians, family medicine docs, emergency physicians, and anyone else who provides medical care for kids, the simple ear infection. A simple problem, maybe, but there's a lot to learn about the best way to take care of it. Our first patient today is May. She's seven months old. Mom and Dad have brought her in because she's had cold symptoms for, for a few days, and last night she woke up several times screaming. She's had no fever, just this runny nose and some cough. Her appetite and energy level have been good. May attends daycare five days a week, and Mom says several other babies have been out this week with colds. May is up to date on all of her routine immunizations. That's a brief history, but it hits most of what we know when we're thinking about a potential ear infection. To understand why those questions are important, we'll need a brief ear anatomy lesson and a few words about viruses and bacteria. When we use an otoscope, we're looking into the ear canal. Way in the back, at the end of the canal, is the tympanic membrane, or eardrum, that separates the outer from the middle ear. Water splashed into the outer ear, or ear canal, can't get past that eardrum and cannot cause any problems in the deeper part of the ear. Past the tympanic membrane is the middle ear, a thimble-sized cavity that's ordinarily filled with air. Within the middle ear are the ossicles, a chain of three very small bones that transmit sound waves from the eardrum to the oval window, a smaller membrane that then transmits sounds to the cochlea of the inner ear. There is also a small opening at the bottom of the middle ear, a sort of drainage system that connects to the eustachian tube, which then connects to the inside of the nose. Any fluid that accumulates in the middle ear is supposed to drain out through this eustachian tube into the nose. Again, the middle ear is supposed to be filled with only air, which allows those ossicles to vibrate freely. If there's fluid in the middle ear, it dampens the vibrations, making it difficult to hear. Okay, you've got the anatomy down. Now, what happens when someone gets what's technically called an upper respiratory infection or, or a common cold. The lining of the nose becomes inflamed and makes extra mucus. That actually may help the virus spread. You, you rub your nose and touch other surfaces and spread those viruses around. See, if you're a virus, all of that mucus helps you get to other people. But that mucus also can lead to problems in the middle ear. It can plug up the eustachian tube, preventing drainage and potentially, the nasal mucus can even track backwards, traveling up the eustachian tube to fill up the middle ear. Almost all ear infections start this way, with an upper respiratory infection creating mucus in the nose. And that's May, our first patient. She had had cold symptoms for a few days. Ear pain or other symptoms in a child without any history of nasal dripping or congestion is much less likely to be from an ear infection. Okay, we've got a cold, and now we understand that sometimes the middle ear can accumulate mucus. What happens next is based on the somewhat icky maxim that bacteria love warm mucus. It, it turns out that bacteria are always living in your mouth and nose, and typically they don't cause any problems or symptoms. But if warm mucus sits still for a few days in your middle ear, that's an ever-growing likelihood that the trapped bacteria will take advantage of this and proliferate. And it's that bacterial infection, not really a secondary bacterial infection after a viral cold that leads to what we've been calling an ear infection. We can get more technical now and start using the real medical term for an ear infection, otitis media. 
Otitis means inflammation of the ear. Anything that ends with itis means inflammation. Pharyngitis is inflammation of the pharynx, the back of the throat. Rhinitis is inflammation of the nose. Otitis, ear. That second word, media, refers to the middle ear. So otitis media is inflammation of the middle ear. Children, and especially babies, are much more prone to these infections than adults. Uh, they get far more cold viruses to begin with, and they have small horizontal eustachian tubes that don't drain well. May looks happy and well. We, we get a big smile, and we can even get her to copy a clapping gesture. That's very reassuring. Children with serious illnesses don't act like that. That overall impression, the first impression from a patient about whether they're acting sick or acting well, is a tremendously important part of the physical exam. So don't rush it. The vital signs come next, and now we'll just say they're normal. Normal pulse, normal respirations, normal temperature. Again, that's simple, but crucial information. People who are genuinely sick and may need urgent intervention will almost always have abnormal vital signs. That's why they're called vital. May has a crusty yellow discharge from her nose, though it doesn't seem to be bothering her much. She's breathing easily, and listening to her lungs and heart, everything seems normal. When you look inside her ears with an otoscope, it's difficult to see all the way to the back. There's a lot of wax there. That is a very common problem in pediatrics, but anyone who works with kids gets good at cleaning those ears out with a little tool called a curette. After a gentle clean out, you can get a good look. Both of May's eardrums look red, bulging, and distorted. The eardrum itself is a thin, translucent membrane. Ordinarily, the middle ear is filled with air, and the eardrum looks a little gray and shiny. You should be able to see right through it and see parts of those ossicles, those little bones. If there's fluid behind it, either partially or completely filling the middle ear, the drum can look dull. If the fluid is infected, that infection builds up pressure, and the eardrum typically bulges out at you and looks pink or, or red. That's what causes the pain of otitis media, the pressure and inflammation of the infected middle ear fluid. Okay, we, we've confirmed the diagnosis and it fits the history. Now, what's the best way to treat this? Treatment of otitis media should always start with pain relief. These things hurt. A simple heating pad can help some. I, I prefer parents to use the kind you heat in the microwave, not an electric one, so we're sure it won't get too hot. You can also use eardrops to try to numb the eardrum. Uh, those are only partially effective and were recently taken off the American market anyway. When you think about it, the pain comes from nerves all over the middle ear, not just from the eardrum. So drops in the ear canal can't get into the middle ear space. They just numb the drum. The most effective way to reduce the pain caused by a middle ear infection is with an oral analgesic, like acetaminophen or ibuprofen. And the best way to use those is around the clock, regularly, for, for a few days. You don't have to wait for the child to be in pain. These medicines work better if they're given on schedule before the pain gets bad. We'll also give the family a prescription for an antibiotic. Now, it turns out that in a healthy child, most ear infections will get better on their own without any antibiotic. That's most, but not all. And antibiotics will help the infection go away quicker and will help prevent rare but important complications from otitis media. Those could include the spread of infection into the bones around the middle ear or towards the brain. That's, that's rare, but it can happen. Current recommendations suggest we use antibiotics for just about all ear infections in children under age two because they're the most likely to have complications and because they have a more limited ability to tell us what's wrong if they're not feeling better. In our brief ear infection history, we also asked about exposures, 
May is in daycare, which means more cold viruses and more ear infections. On the plus side, she has had all of her immunizations. Though there isn't a vaccine that is designed to prevent ear infections, many of them can be prevented by some of the routine vaccines, including the pneumococcal and influenza vaccines. It's two weeks later now, and the family has returned with May for an ear recheck visit. That's an important step because May isn't talking yet. She cannot tell us if her ears still hurt or if there are any other changes in her hearing. And especially in young children, restoring normal hearing after an ear infection is important. If May's hearing is, is muffled by persistent infection or persistent middle ear fluid, it will be hard for her to learn to talk. Mom and Dad say they finished the antibiotic and May has been acting well. But when you take a look, there is still fluid there behind the eardrum. It's not red, it's, it's not bulging, it's more just clear or a little milky white. This is a common problem and the approach to this has changed over time. The ear infection we saw two weeks ago, we call that otitis media, though more formally, it should have been called acute otitis media, or AOM. That's to distinguish it from what we're seeing today, which is serous otitis media, or SOM. Serous here means fluid, uninfected, clear fluid. When we explain this to the parents, it's important to pronounce that word correctly. It's serous, not serious. It's unfortunate that these two words sound similar because though serous otitis media is important to understand and deal with correctly, it is not serious. Serous otitis media can follow after a successfully treated acute otitis media. The infection is gone, but the fluid hasn't yet drained, perhaps because there's still some congestion and swelling in the nose. Or, serous otitis media can happen during a cold virus, just fluid in the middle ear that isn't infected. In the old days, we didn't make much of a distinction between serous and acute otitis media, but research and guidelines over the last 20 years have stressed that serous otitis media does not require antibiotics and that, in fact, antibiotics are unlikely to do any good. The correct thing to do about serous otitis media is sometimes the hardest thing for doctors to do. We suggest doing nothing or, or just waiting. We'll recheck the ear again in a few months at the next checkup, and unless an infection develops with redness and symptoms, we'll wait for the residual fluid to clear on its own. If the fluid lasts longer than three months, we may refer May for a hearing test. If she has persistent fluid for months and months and a problem with hearing, only then would it be time to consider surgery to place tubes to drain that fluid. We've got another patient waiting, and this one was squeezed into the schedule. His parents called ahead, and our triage nurse agreed that this was a child who needed to be seen right away. We head in to see Ezra, a 10-year-old boy. When he woke up this morning, his parents tell you his face looked weird, like the right side was kind of drooping. He says he feels okay, but his right ear feels kind of full, and his face, in his words, isn't working right. On the physical exam, Ezra's vital signs are normal, and he looks comfortable and well, but the right side of his face is indeed drooping, especially the corner of the mouth on the right. When you ask him to shut his eyes tight, his right eye closes only a little, and he cannot lift his right eyebrow or wrinkle up the right side of his forehead. His right eardrum is dull, pink, and bulging. What Ezra has is called a facial nerve paralysis. The nerve to the muscles on the right side of his face isn't functioning. The physical exam, those simple things we looked for, have already told us that this couldn't have been a stroke or damage to the brain itself. A, a stroke can cause weakness in elevating the side of the mouth, but typically no weakness in lifting the brow. That's because the muscles of the upper part of the face get input from both cerebral hemispheres, not just one side. The weakness of the total right side of Ezra's face, the mouth, the eyebrows, and the forehead, 
means in neuroanatomic terms that this is a problem that has to be in the facial nerve itself. Why does Ezra have facial nerve paralysis? It's a rare but well-known complication of his right-sided ear infection. The facial nerve travels close to the middle ear space, and sometimes the infection can spread to put pressure on that nerve. Ezra's care was much more aggressive. He was admitted to the hospital for IV antibiotics, and a CT scan confirmed that there was no other mass or other cause of his facial nerve paralysis. A small tube was placed through his eardrum to allow better drainage. His infection cleared quickly, though it took two months for the complete return of facial nerve functioning. Complications like this are rare, but they're a reminder that even common and seemingly simple infections can sometimes lead to bigger problems. Let's meet another patient, Tai Lee, who's 15 months old, and she presented with a cold that lasted several days and then fussiness. But Tai Lee has already had five previous ear infections. Her, her parents want to know, is there any way to prevent this? And what should we do next? We don't want to keep putting her on antibiotics. These are good questions. We know otitis media usually begins with a cold. So anything that parents can do to prevent colds will prevent ear infections. Practically speaking, that's not always easy to do. Uh, toddlers are not very hygienic creatures. They, they touch everything and put their hands in their mouths, and that's hard to interrupt. Stopping group care will reduce the frequency of colds, but that's not practical for many families. We mentioned earlier that vaccines can protect against at least some ear infections, so we'll review the record to make sure that Ty Lee is up to date. Secondhand smoke exposure is another ear infection risk factor, so we'll ask about that. Breastfeeding is protective, though the effect size isn't large, an exclusively breastfed infant statistically will have about half of an ear infection fewer during the first year of life. Bottle feeding is especially prone to lead to ear infections if the bottle is propped up vertically while the baby lies flat. It's just a matter of gravity. We won't bring that up now with Ty Lee. She's 15 months old, and whether or not she breastfed or, or how she bottle fed is, is water under the bridge. I've said a few times that ear infections start with nasal congestion, which is almost always related to a viral upper respiratory infection. Occasionally, other factors can contribute. Uh, children with gastroesophageal reflux may have more ear infections, though studies haven't been entirely consistent about that. And allergies can cause some excessive upper airway mucus, which can contribute to ear infections, though that scenario is more common in older kids than in babies. And children with altered facial anatomy, say, say from a cleft palate or Down syndrome, often have more ear infections. We talk about otitis media prevention while examining Tai Lee, or, or we try to. At least 15 months can be a tricky age. It's difficult to get a good look, and we have to hold her down. Now, we'd really rather not do that. She's got a good memory now, and, and holding toddlers down does not help build good relationships. I'll try distraction, I'll lie on the floor, anything really to get a good look. But sometimes you just have to show mom or dad a good hold, get your look quickly, and then let the child have a nice hug. Sometimes, no matter what you do, you have to honestly admit to parents that you never got a great look, and you have to make your decision based on a less than ideal exam. This time, though, with a brief hold, we got a great look into Ty Lee's ears. Or we should have, anyway. But what we see is that both of her ear canals are filled with yellow fluid, and you cannot see her eardrums at all. What you're seeing is pus, and it's almost certainly come from burst eardrums. Ty Lee had infections behind those thin membranes of her eardrums, and that pressure built up enough to cause the drums to break. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, think about where this infection is in the middle ear on the side of the head. Uh, that's not too far from the brain. 
if there's a lot of pressure, we'd much rather it burst outside through the eardrum than force infected fluid inwards towards the brain. A burst eardrum allows the infected fluid to escape, which releases pressure, and that actually relieves the pain, too. And an eardrum that bursts once or, or even a few times is almost certainly going to heal and not affect hearing in the long run. For today, we'll clear out some of the infected mucus from Ty Lee's ear canals with a soft swab and prescribe antibiotic ear drops. Remember, in most ear infections, antibiotic drops don't make any sense. They just go in the ear canal and couldn't get through the eardrum to the site of infection in the middle ear. But in Ty Lee's ears, those eardrums are broken, so drops put into her ear canals can go right through to her middle ear cavities. Eardrops, in this case, are superior to oral antibiotics because they cause fewer potential side effects and can get a high concentration of medicine right at the site of infection. We'll also start talking with Ty Lee's parents about an ENT referral. It's time to consider one of the most common surgical procedures performed in the U.S., placement of ear tubes. We had mentioned that before uh, with May, if she had persistent serous otitis media with fluid plus hearing loss, ear tubes should be considered. Uh, another situation to think about ear tubes is Ty Lee's, recurrent, frequent, or persistent ear infections. When we say tubes in ears, what we're talking about is the placement of small plastic tubes through the eardrum, creating a semi-permanent connection between the outer and middle ears. That will allow any fluid that accumulates in the middle ear to drain outwards into the ear canal, even if the eustachian tube is blocked. Children with ear tubes have fewer infections, and any infections they do have can be treated more easily with drops rather than oral antibiotics. Once there are tubes in the eardrums, externally applied drops can get through the tubes into the middle ear. Now, any kind of surgery on a child is, is a little scary, and there are some risks of tube placement. The anesthesia itself has a small but real risk. You have to put the child completely asleep to do this. It, it's just a few minutes, but you cannot place tubes in a child who, who is moving even a little bit. Although the tubes themselves are meant to stay in for about a year or so, they sometimes have to be removed if they stay in too long. And sometimes, to, to parents' frustration, they fall out too quickly. After they fall out, the hole they leave behind usually, but not always, closes up on its own. And every once in a while, a child develops excessive drainage and inflammation from the material of that tube itself. Still, for many children with frequent ear infections, tubes are a good option to help them stay well and off antibiotics. It's especially a good idea to consider tubes earlier in any child with developmental challenges, especially speech delay. Tubes will quickly restore normal hearing by keeping fluid out of the middle ear, and children need to hear well in order to learn to speak clearly. By the way, Ear tubes, more formally called myringotomy tubes, are among the most common surgical procedures. One in 15 children in the U.S. has tubes placed because of ear infections. Let, let's meet a few more patients. I'm going to focus on just the details that make these unique to illustrate more about the variety of presentations and decision making. John's a three-year-old who has a cold, then woke up last night complaining of ear pain. On his exam, he looks good. He says it doesn't hurt anymore, and his right eardrum looks just a little pink. John has a mild ear infection, and at this age, it's very reasonable to talk about the option of waiting to start antibiotics. Most ear infections do get better, and we can even prescribe what's called a backup antibiotic prescription. If his pain persists or worsens, we know that most of the time, these prescriptions don't get filled, which keeps kids off antibiotics. That's a good thing. But parents may still want that backup, a way to treat the child without having to return to the doctor or call on the phone if symptoms get worse. Now, 
let's change the scenario a little. Uh, John's still three, but he's really complaining of pain. Worse, he's vomiting, and his physical examination shows a red and bulging drum. Vomiting is not uncommon with an ear infection, especially a bad one. In this scenario, we'd want to start antibiotics, perhaps given after a dose of a medication to relieve nausea and vomiting, so he's sure to keep it down. Alternatively, we could offer the antibiotic in an injection. That hurts, but, but it's sure to stay in John's body, even if he continues to throw up. We use injected antibiotics if there's persistent vomiting or if ordinary oral antibiotics have failed to clear an infection. About those antibiotic choices, for simplicity and shorthand, we sometimes speak of strong or, or stronger antibiotics. In truth, antibiotics don't work that way and can't really be judged as weaker or stronger. Antibiotics need to be judged by how likely they are to kill the specific bacteria that are causing a specific infection. All antibiotics have what's called a, a spectrum, a list of bacteria that they kill well. A narrow spectrum antibiotic kills only a few kinds of bacteria, and a broad spectrum antibiotic kills many, but both of them kill just the same. One isn't faster or stronger than the other. It's usually best to choose a narrow spectrum antibiotic that only kills the bacteria that's likely causing an infection, because broad spectrum antibiotics are more likely to have side effects and more likely to kill off normal healthy bacteria that happen to be living nearby. These so-called good bacteria are an important part of your digestive system, and they affect your immune system as well. So let's not kill them off if we don't have to. Stronger isn't an accurate word to describe an antibiotic, but if we're going to use that word, we ought to remember that stronger does not equal better and might even be worse. One more patient. Patrick. He's 11 years old and complains of ear pain. When you look, his, his eardrum is absolutely normal. It, it turns out that other things can cause ear pain too. Sometimes pain referred from elsewhere, like, like the jaw or a tooth. Or sometimes it's the ear canal, the part right inside the opening that's red and inflamed. We call that otitis externa, meaning external otitis or inflammation of the canal. This can be caused by trapped water from swimming, that's why it's sometimes called swimmer's ear, or from irritation or trauma from, say, uh, too aggressive use of cotton swabs in the ear. Otitis externa can be treated with ear drops. And every once in a while, we'll see a child with ear pain who has nothing objectively wrong on their physical exam. Perhaps they felt some pressure or a passing pain but sometimes the ear and everything else looks good, and it's a matter of reassurance. One new angle on ear infections, having parents use an otoscope at home, perhaps as an attachment to a smartphone, and transmitting that photo to a physician to interpret the image. I'm not sure that's ideal. It's actually difficult to get the eardrum into a good view, especially in younger babies, and that's the age at highest risk. And that's the age when you lack the ability to ask about ear pain. We'll have to see how these uh, gizmos work out, but hopefully they won't drive unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions for questionable diagnoses. What's the big deal about that anyway? I mean, most of the time, antibiotics don't do much harm. Believe me, Antibiotic overuse really is something to worry about. In the short run, you may have side effects or allergic reactions, or even encourage the overgrowth of gut bacteria that can cause severe gut inflammation. That can lead to an ICU stay, surgery, or worse. But in the long run, the overuse of antibiotics is encouraging the development of so-called superbugs, bacteria that have essentially learned to become resistant to most or maybe even all of our available antibiotics. That has become a huge problem in hospitals around the world, and it's entirely our fault. 
doctors shouldn't offer to prescribe antibiotics unless they're really needed. If you are giving your child antibiotics, follow the instructions and complete the entire course. Do not hoard antibiotics for next time. There are about 6 million healthcare visits each year in the United States for ear infections. You'd think we'd all agree on how to handle such a common problem and that the diagnostic and treatment decisions would be straightforward. But as you've seen, even a comparatively simple problem like an ear infection still raises a lot of good questions. The diagnosis isn't always easy and strategies for prevention, treatment, and dealing with recurrences have to be individualized. As pediatricians, we see a lot of miserable kids with ear infections, and some miserable parents, too, who wish their children could stay better so everyone could get a good night's sleep. There's a lot to learn to get it right. Next up, who's got allergies and who doesn't? And how do allergies cause problems at different ages? How has our knowledge about allergies changed in the last few years? There's always more to learn. See you next time.